From all of us here at Keen Investigations, we hope you're having a great day. The evolution of the patrol car begins in Detroit, Michigan in the early 1900s. Frank Crowell was the police commissioner of Detroit, Michigan from 1909 to 1913. Then, as now, the city was the heart of the American auto industry. Ford, Studebaker, Packard, and Cadillac were all headquartered there. And as Crowell saw an ever-increasing number of cars buzzing around the city streets, he wondered if they might have some use for the police. He wasn't the first person to consider such a possibility. In 1899, the city of Akron, Ohio paid the Collins Buggy Company $2,400, $65,000 today, for a battery-powered paddy wagon, complete with stretcher, a cage for prisoners, electric headlights, and a gong. America's first horseless police vehicle left a lot to be desired. Weighing 5,000 pounds, it had a top speed of just 16 miles an hour and a range of 30 miles before the batteries had to be recharged. A year after it was built, an angry mob pushed it into the Ohio Canal during a race riot. Though the wagon was returned to service, the city never bothered to build another one. As Crowell could tell from watching the traffic in front of his office, motor vehicles had improved a lot since 1899. Cars with the quite recent gasoline engine had none of the problems with range that the older electric cars had. Now that automakers had been building them in quantity for nearly a decade, gas-powered automobiles were becoming quite reliable. Some were even affordable. Crowell thought the time was right to buy a car for the Detroit Police Department. Although when he asked the city for money to buy one, they did not think it was a good investment and turned him down. Crowell was adamant he was so sure that police cars had a future he bought the department a Packard with his own money, $5,000. More than $100,000 today. Crowell's hunch proved to be correct. His Packard was much more useful than Akron's electric paddy wagon. It was speedy and reliable, needed less care than police horses, and it allowed police to get to the scene of an emergency much faster than if they went on foot or in a horse-drawn wagon. After just four months, the city reimbursed Crowell for the Packard and made plans to buy six more cars. These proved so economical to operate less than half the cost of horses and wagons they replaced that by 1913 even the city dog catcher had his own gas-powered truck. Detroit's last horse-drawn vehicles were phased out forever. Even in those very early days, police cars were also known as patrol cars, but they didn't do much patrolling because there was no way to communicate with them once they were away from the station. Police radios hadn't been invented yet, so patrol officers had to wait at the station for emergency calls to come in. Then, as soon as they finished with one call, they had to return to the station to wait for the next one. In 1917, Detroit began deploying automobile patrol officers to special telephone kiosks set up around the city. One officer sat at the kiosk waiting for the phone to ring, while his partner patrolled their beat on foot. When a call came in, the kiosk officer hopped in the police car, went looking for his partner, picked him up, and responded to the call. Some cities installed special red lights at major intersections and on top of tall buildings as a way to signal patrol officers as they were driving around. When the lights were lit or flashing, the officers knew they needed to find a telephone or a police call box to check in to receive their assignment. It was obvious that if a way could ever be found to install radios and automobiles, police cars would become a much more effective crime-fighting tool. But in the early 1910s and early 1920s, it wasn't clear if such a thing was even possible. Automotive electric systems generated a lot of static interference but they weren't powerful enough to provide electricity for add-ons like radios. The radios themselves were very bulky, and the vacuum tubes that made them work were fragile, not the kind of thing that would do well vibrating and bouncing around in a speeding police car. In 1921, a Detroit police officer named Kenneth Cox teamed up with an engineering student named Robert Batts to try to install a radio in the backseat of a Model T. It took them six years to do it. The radio had trouble receiving signals in tunnels, under bridges, and around tall buildings. And the radio batteries, which wouldn't fit in the back seat, had to be installed on the running boards. Needed to be recharged every four hours, but the radio worked. Just like the radios you listen to music on, Cox and Bat's radio was a one-way radio. It could only receive signals, not send them. Patrol officers still had to find a phone or a call box to check in with headquarters. 
but it was enough of an improvement over the phone kiosk that in 1928, the Detroit Police Department began operating its own radio station, KOP. Because the Federal Radio Commission saw broadcasting as primarily an entertainment medium, it required the police department to play music on KOP when it wasn't broadcasting police calls. Anyone with an ordinary AM radio, even criminals, could listen to the station. More than once, the FRC suspended the station's license when the police department didn't take its entertainment responsibilities seriously enough. Luckily for law enforcement, though, the FRC soon realized the error of their ways and stopped requiring the police department to act as a disc jockey. Then, in 1933, engineers working for the Bayonne, New Jersey, police department developed the first two-way police radios. Within a few years, General Electric, RCA, and Motorola were making them for departments all over the country. They weren't cheap. The radios cost more than $700 a piece, more than some police cars at that time. But they became standard equipment everywhere. Early police cars were almost indistinguishable from other cars. They were typically dark in color and might have the word police or PD hand-painted in small letters on the driver and passenger side doors. But that was about it. They had no extra lights. Early automotive electrical systems could not power them. And what few sirens there were had to be cranked by hand. The Detroit Police Department didn't bother with sirens. It issued motor vehicle officers loud sounding whistles. New York City's first police cars were convertible to enable citizens to see the officers police hats so they'd know that they were police cars. Patrol officers were under orders to keep the top down so that the hats could be seen, unless a superior officer gave special permission for the top to be put back up. Rain or even snow was no guarantee that permission would be given. Police cars began adding spotlights for extra visibility as soon as electrical systems could handle them. The first ones were repurposed taillights, which explains why they're red, and were mounted on the front fender, the front bumper, or the roof. Some cars had them in pairs, and others had an extra light mounted on the front right fender that would read pull over or stop when lit, which was used to stop speeding drivers. The first 360 degree rotating gumball light called the Beacon Ray was introduced by the Federal Sign and Signal Company in 1948. Red and later blue gumball lights remained popular through the 1960s, when they began to be replaced with horizontal light bars that included multiple rotating lights, mirrors to reflect their light in all directions, and a siren. For all the changes that police cars have gone through their first hundred years, one thing has not changed, at least not since the angry mob pushed the city of Akron's custom-built electric police wagon into the river in 1900. Police cars have always been modified versions of standard automobiles, nothing more. Automakers didn't even offer special law enforcement upgrades such as improved brakes, tires, steering, and suspension until Ford added them to its first police package in 1950. GM, Chrysler, and other major American automakers soon followed, and the police cars have been made that way ever since. So far, none of the big three automakers have ever designed a purpose-built police car from scratch. Because annual police car sales are way too small to justify the expense. What is your favorite make and model of the police car? Let us know in the comments below. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to pursue that like button. And if you are new here, hit that subscribe button and please share the video with friends. It really helps the channel. We upload this series every Thursday evening and post a new unsolved crime mystery every Sunday afternoon. Keen Investigation is now on Patreon. If you would like to help us improve the quality of our videos and our channel, anything would really help and is greatly appreciated. Thank you for all your support. We look forward to seeing you all in the comments, and as always, have a great day.